So we've looked at adverse effects of immobility on the cardiovascular system and the respiratory system. Let's now go and look at the musculoskeletal system. And the first thing I want to look at is the effects of immobility on the skeletal system, on the bones themselves. And the first point we're going to look at is osteoporosis. Now osteoporosis is loss of bone mass. The bone demineralizes and becomes less dense and lighter. This has the effect of weakening the structure of the bone and making it more likely that things like fractures will occur because the bone is not as strong as it was. So let's first of all think about osteoporosis. So we think about the muscular system. First point, osteoporosis. And as we've said, osteoporosis is demineralization of bones. This means that the mineral content of bones, largely the calcium, is lost from the bones. And this occurs due to reduced activity. And if you think about it, if you're losing bone mass, if you're losing bone density, that can cause changes in the size and strength of the bone and in the chemistry. And the bones appear different. They appear lighter because they're less dense. So loss of bone mass. Now this osteoporosis is a problem often in later life. Anyway, as people get older, they tend to lose bone mass. And it's particularly a problem in, uh, in females uh, who, who do tend to get osteoporosis. In fact, this is one reason why people uh, lose a bit of height and become a bit crouched sometimes as they get older. But the thing about bones is that they're built up as a result of stress. When there's a line of stress going through a bone, that causes the bone to be built up and to be strengthened. If you take that stress away, the bones seem to think, well, I'm not really needed here, I'll demineralize. It's, if it's not being used, um, it loses mass and loses strength. And again, uh, look, thinking about the analogies between immobility and space flight, this is a big problem in, on space flights. Astronauts have to spend a lot of time exercising to try and put stress on their bones. But I think you can see, like, if I'm standing now, then there's going to be some stress on my weight-bearing uh, bones, on my femur, on my tibia and fibula, on my pelvis. So, so they're going to be under some stress, and that's going to encourage them to retain their mineralization. But if you take that stress away, and someone is uh, lying around in bed or sitting, there's less stress on the bones, therefore the bone tends to demineralize, and this is what we call osteoporosis. So it accelerates, if you like, the aging process in a sense. Now, the osteoporosis usually only becomes a problem in the medium to long term, if someone's immo immobile for a few weeks to a few months. But it's interesting that increased urinary secretion of calcium begins in the first week of immobility. In the first week of immobility. So what this means is, if you think about it, if the calcium's leaking out of the bones and the other mineral salts are leaking out of the bones, they're going to go in the bloodstream and there's going to be too much calcium in the blood. And that's no good because that disturbs homeostasis and it's very important that calcium is regulated at a, a constant level in the blood because of course it's an electrolyte. It can, and it can affect the activity of excitable cells like nerves and muscles. So you can't have too much calcium in your blood. So the end product is that the calcium is excreted. It's passed out in the urine. So in, in a very real sense, the patients uh, excrete their bones or part of the content of their bones in their urine. And this is detectable after someone's been immobile for a week, one week. So it wouldn't be a problem, of course, in most people because they've got spare bone mass in a sense. But it just shows you that bony demineralization does start to occur after one week of immobility because you can detect the raised levels of calcium in the patient's urine. So first week of immobility. How are we going to prevent osteoporosis? Now this is the thing we want to learn about, of course. How are we going to prevent it? Well, we've said that it's stress that keeps bones mineralized. So we want to put stress and weight on bones whenever we can. So it goes back to the same principle when we're nursing patients who are immobile. We want to minimize the amount of immobility and maximize the amount of mobility. So put weight and stress on bones whenever possible. So if you can stand the patient up occasionally, then certainly do so. So effects on the muscular system, oh, sorry, on the skeletal system, the osteoporosis. 
Let's now go on and think about the effects on the muscular system. And the effects here are primarily muscle wasting and uh, joint stiffness occurs. Muscle wasting and joint stiffness. Now muscle weakness and atrophy can occur within three to seven days of the onset of bed rest. And it's most noticeable in the anti-gravity muscles used for standing and walking because, again, these muscles will not be being exercised. Therefore, they tend to atrophy. Now, in atrophy, there's a reduction in the size of the muscle. And again, this is a common observation. If you do lots of workouts with weights or something, then your muscles get bigger. But if you don't use muscles, they get smaller. So if the muscles aren't used, they get smaller, muscle atrophy occurs. And as well as that, they, they, they tend to get stiffer. The, the, the muscles and the tendons and, and things all tend to get stiffer. So the whole thing tends to stiffen up. And of course, the less the patient moves, the less they want to move. So that's the first point, muscle weakness and atrophy. And notice this is occurring fairly rapidly here. It's within three to seven days of the onset of bed rest. So it can occur fairly rapidly. So in, in any patient who's immobilised for more than a few days, the muscles be atrophy and connective tissue tends to become progressively resistant to movement. So things like tendons become progressively resistant to movement. And ultimately, of course, the joint can become, can become fixed. And uh, I'll just show you an example of a result of immobility now. Now this is a case of a neuromuscular disorder and uh, th this child unfortunately has got quite pronounced uh, atrophy of the muscles and uh, the, the, the bones aren't anything like as strong or as dense as they should be because uh, the neuromuscular disorder has caused paralysis of the lower part of the body and I think you can see it's significantly uh, atrophied partly due to the pathological process, but largely due to the fact that uh, she's been immobile for some time due to the paralysis. So as we've already started to explain, when immobile, the collagen fibres... Now the collagen, collagen is the common connective tissue... Sorry, is the common component, a common component of connective tissue... So there's a lot of collagen in things like tendons, which of course connect muscles to bones, and indeed in ligaments, which connect bones to bones. So when immobile, the collagen fibres and connective tissues of the tendons, ligaments, and the joint capsule, the fibrous tissue surrounding the joint capsule that contains the synovial fluid, all these connective tissues to do with the joint become denser and they become firm. And this leads to fibrosis. So you get fibrosis, overgrowth of fibrous tissue in the tissues surrounding a joint, if that joint is immobilised for any period of time. And this fibrosis results, of course, in the further loss of movement. And this work results in a vicious circle. There's some fibrosis and the movement is reduced. Because the movement is reduced, there's more fibrosis. Because there's fibrosis, there's less movement. The whole thing's a vicious circle. So fibrosis resulting in the further loss of motion and joint stiffness. And this can take just a few days and can take some months to reverse. So this point is important, not only in patients that are immobilised altogether, the patients who have part of the body which is immobilised. So only immobilise part of the body if there's a good reason to do so. For example, if there's a tendon healing up or if there's a fracture. Because the joints involved will become stiffened because of the fibrosis. It can take a long time to, uh, to be completely freed up again. So think about the complications of immobility of part of the body as well as the whole body. Let's now go on and look at uh, contractures, the end result of this process. 
contractures can occur. Now a contracture is a permanent contraction of a muscle group caused by shortening and fibrosis of the muscle fibre. So the muscle fibre itself becomes fibrosed. And that can lead to a loss of muscle function and the joint can actually seize up altogether or alteration in function. So contractures, permanent contraction if you like or permanent shortening of a muscle or a group of muscles. Now one example of a contraction, so this diagram looks at foot drop which is a complication of muscle shortening due to immobility. Now normally the foot should be at around about 90 degrees to the leg, so we've got the leg along here and the foot and this angle here is around about 90 degrees, that's a healthy position. But due to disuse, if the calf muscle becomes fibrosed and the calf muscle tends to contract, if you think about the calf muscle here in the back, muscle in that position, and the, uh, the tendon going down here, you can feel at the back of your heel. If this, if this muscle contracts, then that's going to tend to make the foot go down, if you think about it. So you end up with something like this position because the calf muscle is contracted and when the calf muscle contracts it tends to pull the foot down. So shortening of the calf muscle tends to make the foot go down, in fact it can go down much further than that. And it gives the appearance that the foot has dropped. So foot drop caused by shortening of the calf muscle. And one way to prevent it here we see is maintaining the foot at a normal physiological 90 degree angle artificially. Of course you don't want things that are going to put excess pressure on the calf but you might get a short splint that holds the foot up in that position in patients where this may be a particular problem. So foot drop caused by contraction of the calf muscle. Prevent it by keeping the foot at a physiological position and of course regular uh, movement of the foot through its range of movements. So thinking about contractures in general again for a moment, contractures occur as a result of poor alignment of the limbs and poor posture in bed. We are designed to stand up and be mobile, not to lie around in bed. So contractures occur as a result of poor alignment of limbs and, and uh, posture in bed and these can start off after about a week of immobility. So patients who are mobilised for a week or more are at risk from contractures. And the example we've looked at in more detail, foot drop, where the feet appear to have dropped. Condition in which the patient is unable to maintain his foot in the correct position. Partly as a result of gravity, the foot just tends to flop over. But as well as that, I think you can see if there's bed clothes that are tight on top of the foot, that can make it uh, bend down as well. So it pulls the foot down. That results in shortening of the calf muscle, shortening of the tendons, fibrosis of the tendons, and the foot can be left in that dropped position. And if it's there for a long period of time, the joint can become really quite fixed. And it can take an awful long time, indeed if ever, to fully recover its normal mobility. So let's think about prevention of contractures, foot drop, whatever the contracture is. How are we going to prevent the stiffening up of joints and the joints being left in an abnormal, physiologically uh, non-functional position? Well, support and position the limb in what is a physiologically normal position. In other words, the patient needs to look and feel comfortable. The limbs should be in a normal position, a normal physiological position, not an abnormal position. Sometimes you can use various aids such as bed cradles to take the weight off the limbs and that will prevent things like the foot being pushed down into an abnormal position result, resulting in short shortening of the calf muscle. So try and avoid too much weight on the patients. So if they're cold, certainly need plenty of covers, but you can use bed cradles to take the weight of those covers off the patient's limbs. 
very important, maintain a full range of joint movements, move the joint through all its possible range of movement. And the patient should do this as regularly as they can. And as we said before, we're talking about DVTs, so there's no reason why the patient shouldn't move their ankles every 10 minutes. But if the patient can't do it for themselves, then we should move the joints through their full range of movements regularly before these contractures become a problem. We should keep them mobile. Sometimes if the patients can't actually move them, then it's worth doing isometric exercises. An isometric exercise is just tensing a muscle where there's no resulting movement of a limb. And each exercise should be performed at least five times a day. Well, I've got here five times each day, several, several times a day. I mean, basically what I'm trying to say is keep them moving as much as you, as you can, really. So perform each exercise five times each. In other words, move each joint at least five times through its full range of movements several times a day. So if there's no reason not to move the joint, make sure that joint keeps moving regularly. The patient can't move it, you move it for them. But it's got to be very regular. And of course, if the joints are inflamed or infected, then we shouldn't move them through the range of movements, of course, because inflamed areas need to rest. And we can consult physiotherapists to ask them about the best way to deal with this. But normally, if there's active disease process or active inflammation or pain in a joint, then it's normal. it is in fact normal to rest it in that circumstance. It's what we said before, that don't immobilise unless you have an indication to do so, is it, sort of a rule of thumb. So keep a joint moving unless there's some particular reason not to.